morning, Smoky Mountains. God is good all the time. Amen. God bless y'all for being here this morning. For visiting with us today, we're we're sure glad you're here with us today as well. And the chairs in front of me, there should be like a little blue card. If you could just kind of, yeah, there you go, Rick. Thank you for demonstrate that for us. Yeah, uh, take a moment, fill those out, drop that in the offering plate. I sure would appreciate that. If you're a regular attendee, need to update your information, have a prayer request. Uh, Drop that in the offering plate as well, and we'll definitely make note of, of, of those things. A few, few quick announcements, and then we'll, we'll dive into our worship time today. Uh, we do have an elders meeting tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, and the women outreach ministry also meet tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Wednesday night, we'll have adult Bible study at 6.30, youth group at 6.30 as well. And of course, next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Amen? Amen. And uh, we will have two services next week. We'll have a service at 9.30. Then we'll, or, I'm sorry, 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and then a service at 10.30 next Sunday. There'll, there'll be two services. So, um, And then uh, uh, on, on April 23rd, we've done another hike to the Smokies. We're going to go to Rainbow Falls this time. You can meet here at the church at 8 o'clock or meet us out at the trailhead at 8.30. If you have any questions about that, you can speak with Dan. And he's doing a great job with our hiking ministry, and I appreciate, appreciate that. Um, we've also uh, tentatively scheduled a work, work days, work days, plural, for Friday and Saturday, April 29th and 30th. Um, we just set the date yesterday in our leadership meeting, but we'll have a full list of tasks we're going to try and get done next week and some sign-ups. And uh, if you can just help one or the other day, uh, you, we sure would appreciate that. If you have a question about that, you can see Dave or, or James uh, uh, about that. So, And then for the month of April, we're collecting for the Sevier County Food Ministries instant oatmeal, jelly, and Little Debbie snack cakes. So I think that's all I have this morning. I'm going to invite you all to stand with me, and uh, we'll pray, and we'll go into our time of, of, of worship. Father God, we, we thank you for another day of life you bless us with, God. Just over the last hour or two, it's warmed up outside. It's a beautiful, sunshiny morning, God. A, a great day to be celebrating Palm Sunday, the arrival of our king into Jerusalem as he began the Passion Week, which ultimately would lead to our our salvation and, and our hope that, that we, we celebrate this time of year, God. And, and Lord, we just, we just thank you for Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come together as brothers and sisters, as, as, as one body. We're going to talk about the body today, as one body to celebrate what you've done and what you've given to us today, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name that as we go through this worship service that uh, our attitudes, our actions, how we sing, how we listen, how we meditate, how we conduct ourselves with each other today, God, will be pleasing to you, will bless you, will cause you to say, those are my boys and girls, and I'm so proud of them, and I love them so much, God. Lord, I pray that your spirit will also come and move in and through this service, God, that you'll teach us, you'll convict us, you'll move in and through us, Lord, to, to be uh, fearless followers of, of, of you. Uh, God, we pray to be those who cannot be here with us today, those who are traveling, I pray that you'll give them safety in their journeys back home. Those who've traveled to the Smokies for a little of R&R, I pray that their time has been restful. I pray that you'll give them safety in their journeys back home and bless them as they return to their churches and their ministries, God, with just a renewed sense of energy and, and rest and passion for you. God, I pray to be those who are sick and bring healing to their bodies and souls as well. And Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said. Amen. This morning our call... Am I on? Yeah. <laughs> this morning, there we are. This morning our call to worship, worship is from Psalms 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. This morning that's what I want you to do. I want you to sing to him a new song. I want you to sing with all your heart. He's in, we are, he is an audience of one. We're singing to the Lord. So sing with me this morning. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. So glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the 
cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. coming. Let's all be ready to meet him in the air. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a Trophies at last I lay down. 
I will cling to the old rugged, old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left His glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged, old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old blood so divine the wondrous beauty I see for it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged, old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Go the Lord and me this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can worship you this morning in song and indeed this morning, Lord, we pray that uh, everything you've seen and heard this morning is pleasing to you. We pray that you be with the pastor as he brings a message to us this morning, Lord, and may we open our minds and our hearts this morning to receive that word. Again, Lord, we praise you and honor you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, as I begin this morning, I'd, I'd be curious to know how many of you are familiar with a very sobering show on the A&E channel called The First 48. A few of you. It's a show that takes viewers to a murder or some kind of a crime scene investigation where detectives and other crime investigators come together to investigate a murder that has taken place in one of our cities. And it's called the first 48 because the whole idea is if you can solve the crime in the first 48, then that's normally your best shot at solving the crime. But every single episode begins with a dead body that has been discovered. Uh, maybe some shots were heard in the neighborhood and police show up and discover that there's a lifeless body. And you all know what happens as, as they put up the police tape all around the crime scene and people come along and they start investigating the body. They try to identify the body. They might try to look for witnesses who may know who this person is. And, and sooner or later, the coroner will show up and he takes photos of the body. And eventually he takes that dead body, puts it in a, a body bag, zips it up and takes it to away, maybe sometimes to the coroner's office for further investigation. Other times it goes straight to where they begin the embalming process, or in some cases they, they will uh, cremate the body. Now, I, I, I know, I, I know what you're thinking. This sounds like a uh, preacher. That's a rather morbid way to start a, a sermon, isn't it? <laughs> Yet, this is where we find ourselves today in our journey through the Gospel of Matthew. What happened at the cross to Jesus was, in fact, criminal. He was illegally tried by evil men, as we've considered in recent weeks. He was unjustly sentenced to death by crucifixion. We saw that last week. We, 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 uh, we violently, violently killed on a cross, and, and what we have is a body, a dead body. And I wonder in the midst of all the sudden chaos, the unexpected pain, the horrific suffering, when did it dawn on Mary, dawn on Mary, that... Uh, 
the grief-stricken mother of Jesus that something's going to have to be done with the body of her son as he was taken down from the cross. With that a thought in mind, we are nearing the end of our 15-month journey through the Gospel of Matthew. We'll finish it up next week. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. I thought you'd be a little more excited about that. Thank you. We've been in this for 15 months, and uh, we're nearing the end next week in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's, and it's kind of, we've been following Jesus' ministry from start to finish. And, uh, and so if you have your Bibles this morning, open them with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew you use a, an app on your phone or device, Matthew 27, we're going to look at verses 57 through 61. We're in a series that we've been calling King of Kings. You know, we've kind of began with the, the King's Feast. We've kind of been moving up to the, the two, three of the most uh, important events in the history of the world, the death, the burial, which we're going to talk about today, and the, uh, the resurrection of our King. But Matthew 27, we'll pick up in verse 57, as the evening approached... There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Now, far too often, let's just be honest, this is part of the king's life story that skipped over in our eagerness to go from the cross of Jesus on Friday to the empty tomb of Jesus on Sunday. We usually just skip over this, or at the very least, we might, we might lump it into a sermon about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But friends, the burial of Jesus is a matter of first importance. And it's a cornerstone of the Christian faith. The Apostle Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. We looked at this last week. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was what? Buried. That he was raised according to the scriptures. And so you see the seemingly simple fact that Jesus was buried is one of the cornerstones of the Christian faith because when we experience in our baptisms, in this baptistry behind me, what are we experiencing? We're experiencing a death, a burial, and a resurrection. And so symbolically in Scripture, baptism is a picture of, of me, you, dying to our sins and, and my old self dying so that I can be buried and raised to new life in Christ Jesus. Which means this is exciting stuff and it's important stuff. But that's another sermon for another day. Because in all seriousness, how did the body of Jesus get into the grave? And what can we learn? From the king's burial. Well, if you're taking notes, let's take note of the fact that Joseph of Arimathea started off as a fearful Christ follower. He started off as a fearful, he's afraid. We don't know a whole lot about Joseph because this is the first and only time he shows up in scripture is at the, uh, is at the death of Jesus. And then we don't hear about him again. However, there is an old legend, an old church legend, that says that Joseph may have actually been Mary, the mother of Jesus' uncle. And that he was a, a tin merchant by, by trade. And because of his business, the legend says that he traveled in, you know, to the mining community of Cornwall, England, which was renowned for its tin. But not only that, some legends have said that Joseph took his great nephew, Jesus, on at least one of those trips to Cornwall, which is why William Blake's poem states... And those feet of ancient time walked upon England's mountains green and was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen. The legend continues to say that because of Joseph's connection to, to uh, England, he was later recruited by the apostles to take the gospel to England. And on that journey to England, he took the cup of Jesus that was used at the Last Supper, which of course begins the legend of the Holy Grail. But that's just a legend. What do we truthfully actually know about Joseph of Arimathea? 
We can put together a pretty good picture of him because he comes up in all four of the Gospels. They make mention of him. They give us a good look into the man. For example, we read in verse 57 of our text that he was from Arimathea, which was a, an area in Galilee, northwest of Jerusalem. He was a Galilean, like Jesus. We also learn from Matthew that he was a very wealthy, he was a, a rich man. Mark's gospel says he was a respected member of the Jewish ruling council known as the Jewish Sanhedrin, who, according to Luke, Joseph did not, did not agree with the decisions and actions of these religious leaders to have Jesus killed. Luke also tells us that uh, Joseph was a good and righteous man. And so in many ways, Joseph and Mary Matthew, we get a pretty good picture of who this guy is. And he, he seems like he's the perfect guy to take care of the body of Jesus. He's a Galilean. He's wealthy. He, 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 we're also going to see he's a, he was a disciple. We find in John's gospel, that even though he was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, John 19, 38 says that he was a disciple of Jesus. Now that word for disciple is a, is a Greek word that means to follow. It's, it means to be a pupil, to be a learner. When I went to school back all the way back in the, the 1900s, the late 1900s, we sat in desks long before they had dry erase boards and Chromebooks. And we learned with teachers with chalkboards in the front. And we had this really cool thing called an overhead projector. Had this long arm with a mirror attached to the end of it, which could catch the machine's light and redirect it towards the screen or the chalkboard behind us. And, and instead of PowerPoint presentations, we used these transparent sheets that were usually handwritten and had to be switched on and off of the projector by hand. For younger people in the room, if you don't know what a chalkboard or an overhead projector is, just Google it and you'll find out that these are some high, these were some, man, these were some state of the art pieces of equipment. Hallelujah. But we sat in a desk. The teacher talked. We took notes. And hopefully, I learned something. Right? In biblical times, a rabbi, a teacher, would come along. And instead of lecturing, he would say, follow me. And you would follow him. Instead of sitting in a desk, you would, you would follow him. You, you would watch him. You, you paid attention to him. And, and that's how you learned. And, and you were a, a disciple. And so this guy, Joseph, who was very high in the Jewish religious establishment, was a, a follower, a disciple of Jesus. But he was afraid. John 19, 38 says he followed Jesus, but he did it secret. He was a secret disciple because he feared the Jews. He was a secret follower of Jesus, which means he was afraid to stand up to his peers and proclaim that Jesus was the Messiah because the chief priests, the rulers of the people, had taken an official stance that Jesus was a fraud. He was fake. He was not the Messiah, and he was just leading the people astray. But Joseph was like, hey, hey guys, I, as I've looked at the scriptures, as I look at, at Moses and, and, and the law and the prophets, there's no doubt in my mind that Jesus is the Messiah. And he's the one that we've been waiting for, guys. But because he's afraid of what his peers would think and what the Jewish leaders would think, Joseph he just keeps it to himself. He was a secret follower of Jesus. Now, I want you to hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to it in a few minutes. But in the meantime, we need to consider another guy who is also a secret follower of Jesus, a guy by the name of Nicodemus, who the Bible says in John 19, 39, that, that, he was, that, that Joseph was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier visited Jesus at night. Now, those of you who know your, your scriptures, you might know that Nicodemus was also a well-known member of the Jewish ruling council. And very early on in Jesus' ministry, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. We might refer to him as Nick at night, right? He, and he, yeah, he comes to Jesus and he asks some Bible questions. And if you remember how in John chapter 3, he in essence said to him, here you, Jesus says to him, here you are, Nicodemus. You're claiming to be one of Israel's teachers. 
And you, 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 don't, you don't know this stuff. It's obvious. Nicodemus, this is elementary. See, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night because he too was afraid. He didn't want to be publicly exposed, especially to these guys he worked alongside of in the Sanhedrin. He didn't want them thinking that he might have actually believed in this Jesus guy. In fact, in John chapter 7, about six months before Jesus was crucified, Nicodemus would actually stand up in a meeting of the Sanhedrin and defend Jesus' right to be heard, saying, shouldn't we at least give this guy a chance to hear his testimony because he at least deserves that right under the Jewish law to give us his side of the story? Well, Nicodemus was shot down. As one of the chief priests would rather sarcastically say, has any of the other rulers or Pharisees believed in him, Nicodemus? And then they said, then, then they basically asked Nicodemus a question, rather, rather rudely, like, "Are you from Galilee too, Nicodemus?" In other words, in other words, Nicodemus, only only people from Galilee believe in Jesus, and and that's when Nicodemus he also just kind of shrinks back into being a secret follower of Jesus Christ, out of fear of those around him. But you know, these two guys, Nicodemus and Joseph, they aren't the only fearful ones. We read in John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43, that at the same time, there were many among the Israel's leaders who believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they would, they would not confess their faith publicly for fear that they'd be put out of the synagogue. or for They, they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, that passage is probably referring to guys like Nicodemus and Joseph and perhaps some other rulers in the synagogue who were really believers, but they didn't want to be put out of their place or, or lose their title, so they, they didn't tell anybody. Now, we're taking notes. As I was working on this, it occurred to me, you might want to write this down, fear has always been a problem for Christ followers. Fear was a problem for the first century followers, and here we are in the 21st century followers, and fear is still a problem for many of us today. But you see, what is described here in scriptures at the death of Jesus is, is a fearful bunch of Christ followers. Which begs the question, church, are we a fearful bunch of Christ followers, or are we a fearless church of Christ followers. And this is something we really need to, need to pray about and think about because we all know how scary it can be sometimes, especially in this cancel culture that we're living in, to align ourselves with Christ. So let's, let's talk a little bit about Joseph and Nicodemus who were, who were followers of Jesus secretly because it begs the question, are you a follower of Jesus Christ secretly? Do the people you work with or go to school with or work out with at the gym or play golf with or whatever, do they even know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? And if they do, in fact, know it, how, how do they know it? How are you living out your faith with Jesus in a public way? I mean, do you pray before meals? That's, that's, that's pretty simple. Do you carry a Bible? You have a Bible that sits on the corner of your desk at work or in your cubicle. Do, do, you, do you wear your Christian t-shirts to places other than church and church events? Do your conversations with your friends and your co-workers or neighbors ever navigate towards your faith, the church, your relationship with Jesus? What does, what does your social media say? about your following and relationship with Christ. I'm not talking about what you say about yourself in your profile, but what you're posting, what you're commenting on. Are you a secret follower? And when you show up at work or school tomorrow and, and somebody asks, what'd you do for spring break? Or, or what'd you do over the weekend? Will you say, I went to church and it was awesome? Or will you talk about, you know, we went here, we did this. I had an overnighter, I, I did this, I did that, was it, was it, was it, we did something else. Because you see, friends, there are a lot of opportunities for us to not be incognito with our faith like Joseph and Nicodemus, like these others. And here's another telling question i got to ask, what is your fear? 
I mean, really, what is your fear? These guys that we're considering today, that their fear is obvious because they were afraid the Jewish would put them in the synagogue, which was their church. Their, their, their church, their, their, their community of faith. And it meant you're, you're not allowed to come to our church. You're not allowed to be a part of our community of faith and worship here anymore because you don't believe like us because you're not allowed to be a leader here anymore. Plus, you're going to lose your title and probably your, your income as well. And so this, this was a career changer for these guys. And they were afraid. Uh, what are you afraid of? I think one of the biggest obstacles to following Jesus in our culture is we are far too worried about what other people might think about us. And ironically, again, in this cancel culture that needs to be, uh, to be bold for Jesus, perhaps more than ever before, uh, what, are, what, are you, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of somebody at school or worse going to think you're not cool? Perhaps, you're, perhaps you work in a field, in education or something like that, where you could legitimately get in trouble for... The, the, the law of separating church and state. Perhaps you're, you're simply embarrassed. Your golfing buddies might think that, 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 that you're, you're old-fashioned, that you're weak, that you're, that you're too intolerant. What, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid that your, 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 your boss or your workplace is anti-God, which it may be? Are you afraid that your discussion with people that you work out with in the gym and that'll turn anti-Christian because of all the stands the church takes? Are you like, oh, I, I, I don't know about this. I think I'll just, I believe, but I'll just keep it to myself. I think this is a great question to be asking in the 21st century America, but if someone finds out you're a Christian, what are you afraid of? And if you can begin to identify that, then perhaps we can identify ourselves with these two guys that we've met here in our text today. Because write this down, Nicodemus and Joseph don't stay in their fear zones. They come out. I'm sure down the road that they had some fearful experiences of following Christ, but something snapped at the cross. Something happened in Joseph and Nicodemus that changed their entire demeanor. This was probably, you know, in some ways, this was probably the, the worst time in Jesus' story to finally decide, all right, I'm, 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 I'm going to go all in and, and go public with my faith. Because all we have at this point, honestly, is a dead body. Right? Everything was over. So it's easy to come out now. And all the thoughts they may have had about overflow, overthrowing the Roman government and establishing the kingdom of Israel, well, it's dead and gone. Joseph may have thought at some point, I, I did believe in him. He, he, he was a good teacher. I followed him secretly, but now it's, it's too late. But all of a sudden, when it appeared to be too late, Joseph decides... I'm going to go bold, be a bold follower of Jesus now. See, something incredible happened in Joseph. And in Mark 15, verse 43 says, Joseph became courageous and bold as something in him changed while standing at the foot of the cross that caused him to say, I'm all in. I don't know what it was. Perhaps he felt guilty for his part in convicting Jesus and being a part of, of the Sanhedrin that condemned Jesus to death. Or perhaps he felt guilty for not speaking up and saying more. Perhaps he was hoping that, or as he was standing near the cross, that, that Jesus would, in fact, miraculously come down from the cross. Or perhaps it was just the injustice of the cross, the cruelty of the Roman soldiers that we talked about the last couple of weeks that, that caused him to say, I'm going to do something good now. I don't know what it was, but something snapped in Joseph. And friends, my prayer for all of us in here today watching online that, that because of our time at the cross and singing these praises this morning, one day, Lord, lift name on high, the old rugged cross, that, 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 that something will snap in us and all of a sudden we'll go, you know what? Who cares? I'm all in. I'm going to go public with this. With my faith. Which if you're taking notes, Joseph of Arimathea started out as a 
fearful Christ follower, but he becomes, he became a fearless Christ follower who fearlessly did at least three things. If you're taking note, number one, Joseph saw a need. Joseph saw a need. Look again at verses 57 and 58 of our text. As evening approached, there came a rich man, Timothy, named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Now, I looked this word up, body. The word for Jesus' body is a familiar one in our culture. It's the Greek word soma. It might call to mind a women's clothing store, but here in our text, soma is the fleshly body of Jesus. And it's all that is left now. Which, if you were here last week, is this is where we left off, as Jesus has taken his final breath. However, the other two guys who were crucified on either side of Jesus were apparently still breathing. And you'll remember how the soldiers come along and they break their legs so that they couldn't push themselves up anymore and catch their breath. And eventually, because they couldn't do that, they suffocated. But when the soldiers came along to break the legs of Jesus, by the way, this is a biblical prophecy that came true, they could see that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. And that just was a big, and the Bible said his bones would not be broken, all right? And so good measure, they just take a spear and they shove it through his side and blood and water flows out. And, but it comes to this question of what was going to happen now to the body? Have you, have you ever thought about this? Again, I know it may, this may sound a little morbid, but... You know, sometimes we, we know these stories so well that we don't ask some really good questions about what happened to the bodies. The Romans, you know how ruthless they were. They were perfectly comfortable with leaving the bodies on the cross. They left them there for the scavengers and the birds and the, the bodies would just kind of decay and be half eaten. It, 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 was, it was part of their, part of their humiliation. It was the Roman way because they had no heart. They simply, they simply didn't care. But for Jewish people, even if somebody was a convicted felon, they believed that person deserved a proper burial and they would at least throw them into a public grave and allow them to be buried. This was a part of their Old Testament law. In fact, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, that according to the Old Testament law, if someone's committed a crime worthy of death and executed and hung on a tree, the body must not remain hanging on the tree overnight. You must bury that body the same day, for anyone whose hung is cursed in the sight of God in this way, you'll prevent the defilement of the land the Lord your God has given you as a special possession. So apparently, the Jewish leaders felt this applied to those crucified, including those two criminals, and in their mind, Jesus was a criminal as well, and they had to be taken down before sunset, which is why the other two thieves on the other side had their legs broken to kind of speed up the death process, but it already determined that Jesus was dead, and, and if, 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 if there was nobody to claim the body, then it was simply disposed of in a public grave. However, a relative, which Joseph may have been, or a family member, could claim the body which is when Joseph comes on to the scene and saw that need. But here's the thing. Getting the body was not going to be as easy as you might think because it, what, technically speaking, that body still belonged to Rome. It belonged to Pilate, who still had control of the body of Jesus. And, and there was no way Jesus' family and friends, these lowly poor Jews from Galilee, were going to get the attention, the audience of Pilate at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a holiday. Even though it was a Jewish holiday, it still was a holiday to, to most people like we do today, right? Pilate's already checked out. Do you know who could get a hearing with Pilate? A guy who is in the government. A guy who, uh, who has good standing with Rome. A guy who, who had money could get the audience with Pilate. And so if you're taking notes, Joseph saw a need and then Joseph made a decision to go to Pilate and say, I want the body of Jesus. And suddenly this fearful Jewish leader became fearlessly attached to the dead body of Jesus, which admittedly sounds a little creepy. 
But for Joseph, church, it had some deep spiritual meaning. For him, it, it, it was spiritual. In a book by Walter Wenergan entitled Reliving, Reliving the Passion, he captures what it must have been like for Joseph to go before Pilate. Here's a brief excerpt from it. Joseph enters the palace in spite of the risk. All by himself, he asks for the very body which the Jewish council had despised and rejected not a half day ago. Pilate responds, shut up. I'm tired of this business. Get out of here. No, sir, I can't leave. Not without his body. No, I'm sorry, sir, but it really doesn't matter if you kill me. Apart from him, I am nothing anyway. I want to bury my Lord and King with dignity and honor. Except for that, sir, you can take whatever you want from me. It was spiritual for Joseph. Now, as I've done each of the past couple weeks, let me remind you of the brutal nature of the cross. I'm reminded of the lyrics of an old hymn in our hymn books entitled, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. And I want you to remember how wounded it was. There's a lot of blood flowing off of Jesus' body. There were wounds everywhere on Jesus' body because we're talking about a back that had been shredded from the scourging that he had taken. We're talking about the most gruesome of a crime scene you could ever imagine. The prophet Isaiah described it like this in Isaiah 52, 14. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, no one would scarcely know he was a man. Think about how gross, I know this is gross to think about, but think about roadkill. You pass, I don't even know what that animal was. Jesus was beaten and marred so badly that he didn't even look human. And so you see, we're talking about a really gross job, and these guys had to be thinking, how do we even get the body down? He's nailed to a tree. Do the Romans have some way of extracting the nails? How do we hold the body so it doesn't cause more damage? I mean, this was a gross job, people, because it was bloody, it was fleshly, and your hands were going to get dirty, and you're going to get blood on your clothes. If you know anything about the Pharisees, which is what Joseph and Nicodemus were, then you know this was a big deal because they, were, they had these special garments all the time that designated how spiritual they were, and they went through this extensive cleansing ceremonies before doing anything religious. But here they were just a couple hours from the start of Passover, which means Joseph and all those helping him would not be able to celebrate one of their most sacred feasts. Imagine not being able to celebrate Easter next week. If you're taking notes, Joseph saw a need. He made a decision to go to Pilate. Finally, Joseph and Nicodemus, they make a sacrifice. They make several sacrifices. Joseph takes the body of Jesus to prepare it, as gross as it was, and, but he was going to need help, which is when Nicodemus comes on the scene. And so Nicodemus shows up in, in John chapter 19, you know, and, and uh, Nicodemus shows up with 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. Let that register for a minute. 75 pounds of spices and myrrh and aloes in weight. 75 pounds. Now, it feels like Joseph and Nicodemus are kind of dividing and conquering. This. Joseph is like, okay, you know what? We're, we're going to take care of the body of our king and savior. Nicodemus, you go get some spices and linen. I'm going to go to Pilate, and we're going to take care of, of our king's body. And so Joseph goes to Pilate, gets permission to take the body of Jesus. Nicodemus comes along with the burial supplies, and they begin to do what is traditional for a Jewish burial. You know, as I think about this, in different cultures, we have a lot of different traditions of preparing dead bodies, right? For example, the Egyptians are famous for their mummification processes, and mummies lasted for thousands of years. I mean, King Tut, prime example. They, they take out their organs. They put them in. They mummify them. They do all this stuff, which is very, very extensive. And in other cultures, they may be a little less detailed, but they, they do some things well. They might simply ceremonially burn the body. Uh, they might, you know, 
put the body out to sea. You've probably seen examples of, of a body being put on a boat and just kind of pushed out to sea. A lot of different rituals that people do with dead bodies. <laughs> I, I, in fact, I once heard about this lady up the road in Corbin, Kentucky, who actually kept her husband's body in her house for six months by pouring Listerine over the top of it. No, no joke. I had a guy from my church in Indiana whose wife, his first wife, passed away many years ago, long before I knew him. While they were on vacation somewhere far away, he literally, he literally drove her all the way back home to Indiana with the corpse of her body back of his vehicle because he made make sure that she had a proper burial from the funeral directors he trusted and knew back home in Indiana. No lie. Different people, cultures, are funny about this. I've talked to some of you. I know some of you are really funny about the whole idea of cremation. Some of you have ideas that you want to have a big old party. I want to have a party when I die. I'll just tell you right now, all right? My wife knows. And the reality is that these Jewish people had a form of burial, that, that they had a tradition because John... 1940 says, taking Jesus' body, they wrapped it with spices and strips of linen in accordance with Jewish burial customs. It was simple as this. They get together a bunch of spices. They get some linen, sometimes one big linen cloth, sometimes several cloths. They lay the body on the linen. They pour some spices. They roll the body. They pour some more spices. Roll a little bit more. Pour some more spices. Keep in mind, Nicodemus has 75 pounds of of spice and myrrh and aloe. And the practice was to wrap the cloth laced with these spices to keep the body from stinking as it decomposed. And so we're going to need some help with this. We're going to need spices and linen. Enter Nicodemus. And there are two things I want you to note here about the 75 pounds of spices that he brings. It's a lot of spices. But there's a couple things to note here. First of all, this was a very expensive very extravagant contribution. It was a sacrifice he was making. We have historical records of kings and royalty, people of great importance, who the more spices you wrap them up in, the more important they are. I don't know if Nicodemus and Joseph were purposely saying this is a king being buried, but they gave him a kingly burial. Hallelujah. Because they use 75 pounds of spices. That's the first thing. Second thing to notice here is the time consideration. It was a Jewish day of preparation. And since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. But if we put Jesus' death, as the scriptures say, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, the sun goes down at about 5.30, 6 o'clock. Guess what? They have about two and a half hours to get this job done. And as unholy as it may sound, these guys wanted to celebrate the Sabbath and you cannot work as a Jewish person on the Jewish Sabbath. And these two guys were the most righteous Jewish guys there ever was. They've never worked a Sabbath day in their life. So they're rushing around. And you can just see them. Okay, hurry up. Hurry up. They're pouring the spices and they're rolling the body and, and perhaps maybe not as carefully as some would have liked. But again, I... I I really want you to imagine, church, let's just time out. Imagine the gruesomeness of this hands-on job. As they were literally handing the broken body of Jesus. You know where I'm going with this, I think. They've gone public with his body. They've invested their time, their money, their energy at the risk of violating their own Jewish law at the risk of not being able to celebrate the Passover to take care of the body of their king. Amen? And so they buried the body of Jesus in a tomb that was nearby there, a new tomb that no one had been laid in. Again, that was, that was a biblical prophecy as well. Verse 60 of our text says, the tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Here's a sacrifice. It was his own personal family tomb, which is what you would do if you were a wealthy person. And this is yet again another fulfilled prophecy because a book was written 700 years before Jesus was alive and the book of Isaiah that Jesus in his death would be associated with a rich man and here is a rich man, Joseph. 
Very quickly, let's talk about the tomb itself. First century tombs closely resemble what we see in the movies and paintings. My mom is here today. She's been to the Holy Land. She's stepped inside the tomb of Jesus Christ. It's what you see, right? And so in the first century, you had some wealth. You would find a place, a rock, a cave somewhere. You would dig a hole in it, and you'd dig it out. And inside, you'd create a small area with, 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 with benches all around, with little niches carved into the walls. And here's how it happened. After you had wrapped the body up, you'd lay the body on that tomb on the cold slab. You'd roll a huge stone in front of the entrance because you don't want scavengers coming in and, and stealing things and animals coming in and destroying the body. And what you may not know... So according to Jewish customs, is a year, about a year later, you would come back, roll the stone away, you would unwrap the body, and take the remains, mostly just bones at this point, you'd put them in a little marble box called an osiery, and they would stick that in the niches of the wall, and then guess what? You could use that tomb again and again. That's how whole families could be buried in the same little tomb. So it was essentially a reusable casket that Jesus was buried in, which was perfectly fine because Jesus wasn't going to need it for very long anyway, right? He was kind of leasing the tomb, amen? But what we need to know here is how there was no defilement. There's never been a dead body laid in this tomb. So again, another, another prophecy. So you see, Joseph was merely making funeral arrangements. He finally got bold enough at the end of Jesus' life. Now, I just want to take another time out here and say, it is never too late to come to Jesus. It is never too late to come to Jesus. Joseph is the perfect example. At the end of Jesus' life, when he's already dead, he comes to Jesus. And I love how these fearful followers end up becoming bold, fearless Christ followers in our story. Where was Peter? One of the boldest guys in all of this. Where were all the other disciples? Where were the 70 that Jesus had sent out to preach the gospel? Where were all the blind and the lame he had healed? Where were all the lepers he had touched and made clean again? Where were they all at? Well, they were all hiding for fear of the Jews, but in that moment when it counted the most, the people who went public were the ones who'd been most afraid as they publicly aligned themselves with the Savior's death and they invested sacrificially in the body. They honored the body of their king with a proper burial. Let's take a moment, think about this. In just a few minutes, we will celebrate the communion together in which we will symbolically celebrate the body of Jesus Christ with a small cracker. In biblical times, it, it probably was something a little more visual, something a little bit bigger, like a, a, a thick tortilla-shaped piece of bread. You would tear the body off as it's being passed around the table. I would imagine that if Joseph and Nicodemus became Christians, as we believe they did 50 days later at Pentecost, that every time they came to communion, they were moved a little different than we are. It asks whoever was giving the meditation that day said, this is my body broken for you. Joseph and Nicodemus had literally touched the broken body. It was real for them. I would guess they become some of the boldest people ever in faith. We have no record of this, but how could they not after touching the body of Jesus? Which brings us to the question of the hour. Church, what will you and I do with the body of Christ? Even though we're more than 2,000 years removed... We can't actually handle the body of Jesus. The Bible outlines real quickly a few things that we can do with the body of Christ. Number one, if you're taking notes, we are called to never, ever forget the body of Christ. Luke twenty two nineteen 19 says that Jesus took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Friends, the first thing we can do as fearless followers of Christ is to never forget the gruesomeness, the pain, the torture, the carnage of the death of Jesus for our sins according to the scriptures of first importance. I believe the more we understand that, the more, more we handle the body of Christ, the more fearless we can and should become. Number two, we are called to participate in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And those of us who are followers of Christ, then we are in the church of Jesus Christ, which is the body of Christ. And as we give to this body, as we serve in this body, as we sacrifice for this body, we acknowledge that this body of Christ is not dead and buried in a grave, but he is risen and he's alive, which I can't wait to celebrate with you all next week. Amen? But in the meantime, church, Jesus is alive through his church. So the encouragement is for us to become more fearless followers of Jesus and never forget the body and be involved in the church. And by the way, another time out, I don't care how old you are. If you're 80, 90, 100 years old, you are called to participate in the body of Christ. There is no retiring from the body of Christ. There is no stepping back and saying, let the younger people do it. Let's be honest, there aren't very many younger people in here. So it's up to us to participate and be the body of Christ. So young people will be in here. Amen? And lastly, number three, we're called to proclaim, pass on, preach, go public for the body of Christ. Do you remember what Paul said, what I said began this sermon, what I said last week in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4? For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised according to the Scriptures. And then a little further down in that text, Paul exclaims in verse 11, this is what we preach. So with that thought in mind, let me ask you this question. Who are you going to invite to Easter service this coming week? If you're going back home to your churches, who are you going to invite back home in your churches this coming week? So that they can hear this message that Paul calls calls as first importance. I want you to watch this little video on the screens behind me. Miscellaneous, okay. Uh, So what what do we have left in miscellaneous envelope? Nothing. Nothing? Where did it all go? Diapers. Diapers? Since when does diaper money come out? Listen up, you two. We need to talk about Easter. Honey, we would love to talk with you about Easter, but... Mommy I'm and Daddy sick of on you guys. Lucy, hi. Um, look, we know how important it is for you to invite our family and friends to Easter services. We've just been really busy lately. Okay, that's enough, big guy. Excuse you? Who are you inviting to Easter service? I need names, people. Okay, have you? and letting her listen to sermons in the minivan again. Uh, sweetie, can you please just get off the coffee table? (laughs) Look, um, full transparency, uh, mom and dad don't really know how our friends would react if we asked them to go to church with us. People need the Lord. Really need a new naptime playlist. Mm. This is going to be real sad. You're right. People really do need Jesus. Clearly now more than ever. We'll come up with a list of names, okay? Daddy, please try to keep up. Love. No. No, not Chris from work. Yeah. Christopher work. (gasps) 
Who are you going to proclaim this message of first importance? Who are you going to share the body of Christ with this week? Let's stand. Will you pray for me? Father God, we come before you this morning and this time thanking you that your body was sacrificed for us, that your body was tortured for us, your body was broken for us. We don't take for granted that this is a sobering moment from Scripture. We realize the pain you went through for our sins. Help us to never, ever forget. But God, also help us to be enthusiastic, fearless participants in this body, the church. Help us to be a people who are like Nicodemus and Joseph, who will sacrifice for it, give for it, go public for it. And last but not least, Lord, would you, would you soften the hearts, our hearts, to do what you've asked us to do, but also soften the hearts to make people receptive to this message, receptive to our invitations this week. I don't care how many times we've asked people, God, maybe we just keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking for your kingdom, Lord. People need you. We need you, Lord, as well. We love you. We thank you. God, there be one here today who needs to make that decision. As Joseph shows us, it's not too late. It's not too late. We come to Jesus at any point in our lives. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in your precious son's name we pray. And all of God's people said. Amen. So if you got a decision to make this morning, maybe it's the first time you say that I believe that Jesus the Christ, won't you come and make that confession of faith and we'll walk you through that process. And maybe, maybe you want to become a part of the membership here at Smoky Mountain Christian Church. We welcome that as well. Need some prayers? Won't you come? I'd love to pray with you down in front. One of the elders would love to pray with you as well. Won't you come as we sing above all? Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're
Good morning. I'm sorry if I'm a little bit hoarse. Um, I've just gotten back from vacation, and we we spent an entire week down in Florida, and their flowers are much worse than our flowers. <laughs> Plus, I had four kids that we had to keep track of, so a lot of yelling happened and took place. So they forgive me. Um, but in coming to communion this morning, which is open to everyone here who believes, Brian's, Brian's 100% correct. If we never forget, which is why we celebrate every, every Sunday, the Lord's Supper, and if we keep that in our hearts, it makes it much easier to participate. It makes us much more confident. It also makes us much more bold in being able to proclaim his name to those that we interact with, both at work, both in our family lives, and together as a body. So this morning, Smoky Mountain and all those who are visiting with us, would you join me in praying for this morning's communion? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, your body is something that we should carry with us at all times in our hearts. When we're baptized, we say that we want you to come into our heart. But Lord, it's, it's not just the happy picture that we have of you the happy picture where you've got the children around your feet. We must almost so remember that, Lord, without your death, without your being in that tomb, we wouldn't have the hope and salvation of eternal life. Lord, in this communion, let each one of us with our hearts be ready as we take of the bread and we take of the juice, your body and your blood given for all of us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.
and in very much the same way in keeping Christ with us in all that we do let us give cheerfully this morning the sun is shining we have air in our lungs at this point in time we should be very happy let's show that to the Lord this morning dear Heavenly Father Lord we come to you um, as followers who Lord who want to help to proclaim your name Lord we give you thanks for all that you give us our health um, each and every day that we have as an opportunity to be able to serve you uh, may we not look at it downheartedly uh, Lord help us to be uplifted uh, and in all things that we do be cheerful we ask your blessing over this offering may it further your kingdom here on this earth in Jesus name amen this morning as we sing this last song, um, I'm going to ask you to really sing out. We have a good crowd here this morning. Music is beautiful unto the Lord. Sing, uh, I stand amazed in the presence. Stand with me, please. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love. A sinner condemned and clean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrow, he made them his very own. For the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Have a blessed week.